So, um, so let's say, as the Monty Python used to say, now something completely different. So I'm not a political philosopher. I come from a, uh, a different uh, philosophical tradition. And, uh, uh, but I think that there are many, uh, well, many overlaps and many, uh, and many threads of research that uh, are common to uh, socialist, to the, one of the fields of research in which I'm active, which is social epistemology and, uh, and uh, epistemic democracy. So I take as the central tenet of epistemic uh, democracy to be that, uh, um, well, uh, a sort of uh, a way of uh, uh, answering in a, in a new way uh, uh, um, the old question of political legitimacy, that, that is, uh, uh, the, this new th uh, th uh, trend of research, let's say, uh, says that epistemic considerations are at least one factor in the determination of legitimate political authority. Uh, and of course, uh, as we have seen in, uh, yesterday and already this morning, there are many open questions like, uh, for example, which are the mechanisms that assure that an epistemic superiority to a democratic decision, for example, is aggregation enough, or should we add some deliberative system, in which situation, how do we compose uh, uh, um, approximations and deviations, etc. Uh, and another important issue that it is also very, very important for, for epistemologists is, um, and it is a, a, an old, uh, philosophical uh, debate also, um, well, if the appropriate conditions are met, is the will of the many necessarily truth-tracking? Tra uh, truth, uh, As for example, uh, the, the, mm, the uh, uh, Joshua Cohen original position on uh, his epistemic populism seems to imply, or are there independent standards of truth by which the outcome of a collective democratic decision should be evaluated? And also another uh, interesting problem is what kind of truth a democratic decision pro process can attain, like practical truth, <coughs> uh, moral truth, scientific truth. Uh, is truth tracking a contextual property of, a, uh, a, of a democracy or a, or a universal one? Uh, can a democracy be trusted to make correct decision on any issue? Of course, if I want to, if I don't feel well and I, and I want to understand what is my condition, I mean, probably the worst thing to set up is a vote. I mean, it is better to go to a doctor. So uh, is it uh, the truth tracking properties of uh, democracies are, uh, I mean, uh, universal for any kind of truth or uh, contextual for kind, kinds of truth, practical truth? So all these questions are open. And uh, clearly, I'm not going to address all these questions in, in, uh, in my presentation uh, today. And I'm going to try to uh, focus my presentation on some uh, aspects, uh, uh, try, let's say, po present some reflection of some aspects uh, that are related to uh, both, to some aspects that I think that are interesting that are related both to uh, the uh, ongoing debate in social epistemology and in uh, political philosophy. I take it. To, uh, I, I think that the, we we can we can consider that around the the when the early uh, to, uh, yes at the beginning of the the, the 2000s uh, the uh, let's say late 90s and early 2000s we have uh, uh, assisted to a to a collectivist turn in many disciplines. Uh, surely, I mean, in uh, political philosophy, in social epistemology, in uh, the study of collective inten intentionality, and in other disciplines. What, what I mean by uh, a collectivist turn is uh, the intuition, a strong intuition that has been then uh, developed in, in, in various uh, threads of, uh, of research that given the appropriate rules of aggregations of beliefs, choices, and preferences, many problems could find a better, in a sense of an epistemically superior solution, the more people were involved in the process, which was really counterintuitive for certain uh, epistemological traditions, much more individualistically based, uh, the fact that, I mean, we should not be, uh, we should be very uh, careful about accepting uh, other people's opinions and, and, uh, and uh, like, and, I mean, uh, uh, many, let's say, many constraints on uh, individualistic constraints uh, on rationality uh, have been uh, 
uh, well, uh, have been debunked, and uh, really many uh, research programs, I would say also in cognitive science, for example, all the programs, uh, so research programs in social cognition, have started to uh, try to find uh, uh, constraints on uh, rational beliefs and justifications, etc., that were at the level uh, of groups and or collectivities. Of course, the conditions of, uh, to have a sort of intelligent group or uh, um, an intelligent uh, um, outcome uh, of a group decision are different in many contexts. Uh, are different. Uh, I remember very well the discussions we had uh, almost ten, uh, ten years ago, or a little, a little less, maybe seven, eight years ago in Paris on collective wisdom. And uh, uh, clearly, we need a, a certain condition in order to have the possibility to have intelligent outcomes like diversity of opinion, <laughs> independence, decentralization, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, I think that. Uh, I'm really embarrassed that I don't have the image of I'm, I'm looking, yeah, go, it's okay? Okay. Uh, and uh, um, I think that uh, something really uh, important happened last year with uh, Trump elections and, uh, and the Brexit, that all this enthusiasm for <laughs> a new paradigm of collective intelligence uh, um, and also with the arrival of the social web and the deep, uh, let's say, and the heavy use of social webs in the, in the uh, to starting from 2008, let, let, let's say, uh, so all, all this enthusiasm about the possibilities of collective intelligence is uh, like we have had to curb our enthusiasm a little bit. And uh, I think that we, we all have, also people who are uh, here today, we all have this uh, question or this puz puzzle in mind that why people are so smart in producing, in producing sometimes epistemically superior outcomes, for example, by aggregating uh, themselves on internet with experiments like Wikipedia or uh, even the, in the use of Google. I, 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 I give an example in, in the paper like Google Translator. This is one of the possible best uh, success of, uh, uh, of collective intelligence ever. I mean, machine translators have been one of the most important uh, uh, research prog uh, program after the Second World War uh, until Google, basically, uh, based on the most uh, 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 sophisticated theory of language, most possible sophisticated theory of language and you know, artificial, uh, artificial intelligence. And you have a crowdsourcing system like Google that is able to attain a much better result just, you know, just by uh, crunching together a lot of information and, and uh, putting together it in a st with some statistical uh, um, operation. So uh, why p people together can be so intelligent, have these incredibly smart outcomes, and so dumb when they vote, basically. So that is something that, uh, that, so what are the ingredients of spontaneous aggregation, for example, on internet that we are missing in order to design institutions uh, that uh, produce wiser <laughs> political uh, outcomes? I don't think that uh, the dumbness problem is only in the political. I think that maybe many, many knowledge institutions are risking the same, uh, uh, the, sa the, the, the same, uh, uh, Problem and I and I think that uh, yeah uh, uh, the problem uh, is uh, uh, related to the way in which in, in which uh, uh, we um, uh, we inter interact in this uh, sort of collective projects. So my agenda uh, today, I would like just to consider briefly because I don't even know now the, the time is. Yeah, uh, Okay, consider because some parallel philosophical concerns for, of the collectivist turn in political philosophy and in social epistemologies, then present my own approach in social epistemology to tackle the more specific issue of the role of trust in the dynamics of information spread through these collectives, which is really my obsession and my, my field of research. Well, I just say two words on my own approach because it's a little bit... Uh, I think weird and special in, in this context. I'm a philosopher. I'm based in a very interdisciplinary department, the Institut Nicot, in which there are cognitive scientists, social scientists, 
and uh, so uh, and philosophers. So we do a lot of empirical stuff. We are we call ourselves the new natural philosophers, like in the 17th centuries, we, we like to uh, make experiments and uh, also uh, uh, write more, 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 uh, more uh, conceptual uh, stuff. So uh, in, in the focus of my research is really, I'm interested in understanding, in understanding how both the cognitive constraints of our mind and the social institutional constraints on the circulation of information shape our beliefs. So how these two uh, um, constraints shape our beliefs. And uh, uh, I'm really sorry, uh, you are missing uh, an advertisement of my, uh, of my new book that is going to be out. And I hope that this is not going to be considered propaganda. So I uh, sort of try to spell out a, social, a sort of second order epistemology in my last book, which is uh, called Reputation. And uh, it's going to be out by Princeton University Press. It was out in France in September uh, 2017. And uh, in which I try to understand why, why I call second order epistemology, because many, I mean, the many dynamics uh, of belief formation depend on uh, 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 complex uh, uh, social uh, structure that we have, a, we, we must be able to, 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 to master, for example, uh, 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 it depend, uh, they depend on how and why we trust uh, other people and how and uh, how do we attribute a certain reputation to some institutions and to some other people, to some uh, pieces of knowledge, etc., etc. So basically in my work, I try, I try to understand the role of trust and reputation in shaping our beliefs, <coughs> the role of emotions in the circulation of beliefs, and develop some normative principle of what uh, we call in our in our, uh, uh, let's say, um, um, team of research, epistemic vigilance in order to uh, understand how we come to believe th the things we believe in an information dense society as ours. So let me just go quickly on some open questions in both fields, political philosophy, in particularly this uh, approach, uh, epistemic um, uh, democracy, and in social epistemologies. Of course, there are a lot of ontological questions that I won't tackle uh, about what are group, what is something like a group or a collective that we may call it as such, what is a group of peers, what does it mean to, to be a peer, uh, what are the conditions of belonging, for example, to a group, can nations, juries, Wikipedians, people sharing the same, same cultural identity, voters, web users, uh, scientists con be considered as group in the same way, or can we, or should we have different uh, theories of group? Uh, so this, uh, there is a lot of you know better than I do. I mean, there is a huge debate on the ontology of collective entities, especially uh, people like Philip Pettit uh, uh, and Christian List, uh, and uh, but many others. I mean, and uh, these are uh, central questions uh, that uh, are very important also for the debate in uh, in um, in uh, political philosophy. There are many epistemological questions on which grounds our belief attribution to groups are based, on which grounds are these beliefs justified, which are the rationality constraints that we may impose on a group for having justified beliefs. And then there are a lot of methodological questions about the dynamics, what are the cognitive dynamics and the institutional constraints um, that make beliefs circulate in a community and how these dynamics interact among them and can we be sure that, uh, for example, a democratic uh, system may keep its epistemic superiority if uh, the judgment of the voters it is influenced in a weird way by some of these dynamics? These are the new questions that I'm sort of trying to address uh, these days, and they, I think that they are the, more, uh, the most interesting also for this, uh, for this audience, so that's why I would like to focus on this. Uh, okay, so I skip uh, the ontological question about um, about uh, what we can can we consider um, what what are the condition of a group membership and um, and uh, what uh, uh, and if uh, the heterogeneity uh, of groups uh, uh, still uh, appeal for just one ontology and uh, I, there is a lot of debate and also there is a lot of debate. Uh, about uh, the possibility of disagreement in, in, uh, uh, in, uh, inside, inside uh, uh, a group that I think it's very relevant for your own uh, reflection on epistemic democracy. 
and the epistemology uh, of disagreement has become a little industry in the social epistemology. So there is a, 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 a huge literature that I briefly mentioned in my, in my paper. And, and uh, uh, I also have some cautionary remarks on this, uh, uh, on, the um, well, on the role of disagreement in, um, uh, in, in, uh, um, and how uh, disagreement can be useful uh, in, um, in, uh, in um, uh, uh, the cognitive life uh, uh, of a group by appealing to some results, for example, in psychology that uh, show that uh, the polar uh, that uh, situation of peer disagreement can create uh, a mass, uh, uh, even a, a more extreme polarization between, uh, um, uh, between, uh, for example, two uh, two parts of uh, of the same group. Uh, but I'm not going to go into this, and I would be happy to come back to this in, if we have time in the discussion. Even the problem of the belief ascription, that I think it's very important, so what, um, which uh, uh, is the relation between the beliefs we ascribe to a group and the beliefs of its, its member. You know, there are so many uh, interesting solutions, a sort of a, um, supervenient solution that it is the one by, um, advocated by uh, Petit and and many others, uh, a sort of commitment solution advocated by people like Margaret Gilbert and others, uh, and uh, all the lit literature on, um, on the collective intentionality. And here also I have critiques uh, and, uh, and cautionary remarks, but I'm not going to go uh, into this either. So uh, let's stick to the part of my paper that I think is more relevant for the debate uh, 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 today. So the methodological question of the cognitive and social dynamics that of belief circulation in, co in collectives. We have mentioned uh, the problem of propaganda and uh, uh, the problem of fake beliefs, all these new sort of problems that made us so uh, sort of less, uh, I'd say, I don't, I don't know if skeptical, but I mean, a little bit disappointed about the end, uh, uh, about the, the possibilities of uh, uh, having, um, well, intelligent collective uh, outcomes um, all, all together. So, uh, just a few, uh, few remarks. Um, I have uh, uh, some remarks, I, I mean, I have uh, some remarks on, on, on trust, on fake news, and on propaganda. So I would like to be brief. Uh, mm, I think that one open question in, uh, uh, in uh, the debate on epistemic authority is uh, still around trust. I mean, and the, the role of uh, epistemic authority in in a project like uh, uh, epistemic democracy. If we assume, like in a classically with uh, Joseph Rust, that to defer to authority is to refrain from insisting on personal examination and acceptance of the thing uh, one is be being asked to do or to believe uh, uh, as a necessary condition of doing or believing, uh, so, uh, is uh, uh, authority and the appeal to epistemic authority compatible with any epistemic approach to uh, democracy? I think that trust uh, in authority is an indispensable variable in any uh, um, uh, situation of uh, uh, belief circulation and, and, and belief formation in groups. I don't think that a group can, uh, uh, I, I, can I, I think that there are conditions that I try to develop in my, in, in, in my work of rational trust and, uh, uh, and uh, I don't think we can sort of avoid to avoid the trust relationship uh, and uh, uh, being in a, in a pure uh, sort of uh, uh, first order rational uh, 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 setting uh, in which we exchange, uh, exchange re reasons without appealing to uh, other people's, uh, other people's uh, authority. Uh, on this, I, I, I would like to uh, mention an example that has been mentioned by Etienne. Uh, I, I, to I told you that I had free-ridden I, I, uh, I free on his paper because uh, I, I used an example that he used that had, had developed in another in other, uh, in another part of my work. Uh, I, um, 
I would like to really to this thing, I mean, trust in, in authority and, and trust in epistemic authority can be, I think it is fundamental, we cannot uh, uh, avoid it. And the case that has been mentioned by Etienne of the Iraq war and uh, uh, as a case of propaganda, I don't consider it as a case of propaganda. Uh, it is not even a case, either a case of fake news. It is rather the opposite. Uh, it is, uh, you, you will find a sort of, a, long description of, of, uh, of uh, the case in my paper. Uh, rather, it is the opposite. It is the first uh, attempt, one of the first attempts by a, go by a, uh, the, a government, the two governments, uh, uh, to find an epistemic justification to go to war. I mean, usually you don't need epistemic, you don't need evidence to go uh, uh, to war, and you need that this also complex epistemological proce process of uh, sending people there and uh, getting evidence, uh, et cetera. So it is a mixed case of lack of accuracy in the circulation of information, and I reconstruct this, is the story in my paper, and also of lack of sincerity. But it is not a fake news. I mean, even the lack of sincerity was basically more of uh, what the f philosopher Henry Frankel would call bullshitting than uh, really saying something false. I mean, we, uh, the, 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 uh, I don't want to re reconstruct the story uh, here, but I mean, basically, uh, uh, there were two major flaws in the story. One was a lack of accuracy. I mean, really, people, there was a, a, a plagiarism of information, uh, copy and paste uh, of, a, of a paper uh, in one of the, mm, those, uh, one of the, uh, uh, intelligence uh, report that were at the, considered a piece of evidence uh, to go uh, to war, and, and the second flaw was really a lack of sincerity. I mean, um, uh, the uh, Al uh, Alasdair Campbell, the director of, uh, uh, let's say, the communication man of Tony Blair government, was asked to sex up the, the, the report, which means basically to exaggerate a little bit, not to say something false, but to exaggerate a little bit the possible uh, uh, consequence of the presence of uh, weapons of mass destruction. So this case, for me, shows that, uh, I mean, people need trust, and the cognitive trust, and the, the epistemic trust, the cognitive trust, and the political trust are deeply in, intertwined. You can, the cognitive order of society and the social order of society are really uh, very uh, deeply intertwined, so it's very difficult to uh, uh, to give people uh, the truth and to ask people to to come up uh, with uh, uh, I mean with a new procedure to to find the truth. Uh, I'm not a constructivist. I don't think the truth is completely fabricated, but I mean the the it is very difficult to. Uh, uh, n not to rely on authorities, so uh, there is a, a sort of cognitive responsibility, epistemic responsibility, uh, 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 that has not, doesn't have anything to do with propaganda or fake news circulation. Okay, uh, propaganda, and I'm concluding uh, in, a, in a minute, I think I don't even have a minute, I'm just over, and uh, uh, so, uh, uh, we, we had discussion yesterday, we have intuition that propaganda uh, undermines uh, democracy, especially uh, epistemic conception uh, of uh, uh, democracy. It's very difficult to have make good collective decisions in situation of propaganda. I don't. I I'm not sure about this point. I told you yesterday in the discussion uh, that uh, I don't. I I tend to avoid paranoid uh, um, conclusion a la critical theory, like uh, that uh, we will live in a, in a world in which uh, uh, we are controlled by propaganda. And uh, uh, I, I have empirical also evidence uh, on which I have worked, for example, the use of the spread of fake news on Twitter, in which in many contexts, for example, uh, extreme situation context, people correct uh, the fake news very rapidly. So, uh, uh, and uh, fake conspiracy-like news are often shared because of their appeal. You won't believe it, uh, 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 and not because they are their believability. People don't believe it, but they share it. And we also have the data uh, on this. So, I mean, I'm not so worried about fake news, but I think that uh, we should be worried, and this is a case study I want to develop here, but I, I, I am developing in a more details in my new uh, work, 
I think that a revolution happened between uh, Obama's 2012, let's say, high-tech election uh, campaign, which was based on data crunching and uh, census using of census uh, uh, information and uh, with uh, special companies like Catalyst where we were involved, and Trump 2016 deep mine election, which is based on an incredible technological revolution that happened uh, after 2009, which was in Google terms uh, personalization. And today we call the Deep Mind Revolution, which is really one of the biggest revolution in uh, uh, artificial intelligence, cognitive science, uh, whatever you want uh, today. What uh, uh, are the Bre Trump and Brexit campaign based on? They are based on a big economical investment, on the involvement at least of two companies. One is Cambridge Analytica, owned by the Trump supporter millionaire Robert Mercer, and the other one is even more, more uh, sort of dreadful, is, uh, I don't know if you know, Palantir. Palantir is uh, a an, an huge company uh, uh, owned by a supporter of Trump that I happen also, unfortunately, to know very well, who is Peter Thiel. And uh, uh, I, I can, I mean, in the lunch break, I can, he invited in one of his, his think tanks, thinking that I was one of the singularity theorists, uh, and he was wrong. I mean, and so, but I mean, I have all of the, a story about this. And uh, this uh, um, Palantir is basically uh, based on technolo uh, technologies coming from intelligence, and uh, uh, and uh, yeah, and it, it played a huge role in the campaign. And a massive economic investment, and this is something that institutional designer can really just block, in buy advertisement space of target advertisement on Facebook. So massive economic investment that not even the Obama campaign could have afforded. And uh, anyway, the technologies were not available at those, uh, uh, at those uh, uh, times. So you can just, in order to have a, 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 an overall view of what is happening, there is a very good article by Sue Harpen in the last uh, New York Review of Books, uh, for example, how Facebook uh, helped to, uh, to, win in, um, to win the campaign, helped Trump to win the campaign. There has been a massive use, for example, of uh, an Amazon uh, site called Mechanical Turk. All people who do experiments know what it is. Um, so uh, the company, uh, Cambridge Analytica paid 100,000 people in the United States a dollar or two, as we do when we do experiments, to fill out an online survey. But in order to receive your payment, this, those people were also required to download an app that gave Cambridge Analytica access to the profiles of their unwitting Facebook friends. So these profiles included their Facebook likes, this is the most uh, important information you can have about people because all the consumers' information that Obama used were co basically completely useless. The census inform information was more, much more relevant for the campaign. The consumers' information, like cat owners in Arkansas, doesn't say so much about uh, how they're going to vote. The census information is more important, and the, <coughs> the only interesting consumer information is which kind of magazines they, they, or, or newspapers they, they buy. Where are Facebook likes, this is really, wow, this is, this is really interesting. So, is this propaganda? For me, this is the most uh, dreadful pro propaganda that we're going to be inside in, uh, in the near uh, future. We are already in, but this is much more uh, invisible and much less transparent and public and, and much more uh, dangerous. And it is a new form of cognitive intrusion that targets the most vulnerable part of ourself, which is, which is the most vulnerable part of ourself. It is not our emotion or our heart. It is our digital doubles. And I have an article on this with my student, Serena Cirana, that I mentioned in uh, digital doubles, that is the statistical avatars that we have produced uh, through the years by going on uh, using Google, using our telephones, using uh, our f Facebook, etc. We don't own our statistical avatars. We don't know anything about them. Uh, we don't know who are they, which are their, ri their rights. We don't know uh, the, the rights that we have on them. And uh, uh, so we are really very vulnerable about this. So I think 
that this is food for you, for thought, for your students, uh, that I think that a better normative framework to deal with this new form of massive cognitive control is a crucial issue for the success of, uh, of your research project, our research project, but I really uh, am, am very optimistic and I share, uh, uh, for example, an optimism even in these dark times, uh, but I think that uh, well, sometimes going into the details and just taking a case study and see how things work in a specific case, and how dynamics of belief work in a specific case, it's a more sort of a artisanal way, maybe, <laughs> of, of doing research, more journalistic way of doing research, but it can inform interesting and maybe also more conceptual or theoretical uh, or uh, even formal um, uh, research, uh, research project. So I stop here. I'm really sorry about the crash, the technological crash, and uh, and for the uh, abuse of time. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, thanks for for this fascinating talk. Um, I'm first going to just very briefly summarize a bit what, what I think you're doing in the paper and then I uh, will pick out some points on which I'd like to focus my comments. So um, as far as I see it, your paper explores how the idea of epistemic democracy fares from the point of view of epistemology, of yeah. social epistemology in sure. particular, and especially in the light of uh, recent technological development. So you do agree in broad outline with Etienne, just to continue this amazing uh, exchange among you that recent technology-driven social innovation poses a threat to the epistemic functioning of democracy. So that's a point of agreement. But what you disagree on with Etienne is on what the greatest threats are. So my rough impression is, as far as propaganda is concerned, um, you think that fake news is less harmful than Etienne thinks, and you think that big data and profiling is much more yeah. harmful than Etienne thinks. And, um, but the greatest threat, uh, in your view, does not come from propaganda, but rather from the, the misplaced trust in epistemic authorities, if I get the point, about um, the... Um, mm -hmm. um, um, yeah, the Iraq war. war. Yeah. And I think that's a really strong point uh, to my mind, and an interesting point about trust. Um, mm -hmm. But I, I won't say so much about it uh, in my comments because you do not um, say so much about it in the paper. <laughs> so uh, maybe you, you want to say more about it. Uh, um, what I wanted, want to comment on is maybe briefly first on um, what to say on reasoning in groups. So in the paper um, you say that reasoning is a social capacity aimed at persuasion and argument winning. You take this claim from Mercedes Berber, the new book that I haven't read so far. I promise I will. Um, you should. I, I just, <laughs> it's a must. Yeah, I, I just think, um, I just want to ask you if uh, reasoning is really um, the topic we should be concerned about here, because there are so many senses of reasoning and a seemingly harmless ways of talking of, of reasoning I, when I all by myself try to figure out what follows from certain premises, or when I all by myself try to figure out what's the cheapest way to get from here to the airport, it seems like I'm reasoning, but I'm not engaging in any social practice, I'm not trying to persuade or to win an argument, so that makes me think that the real topic here is not reasoning, but maybe public reasoning, maybe group deliberation, and when it comes to that, the idea seems to be that um, this, in, in real life, um, most instances, or maybe virtually all instances of public reasoning have this, uh, this, this antagonistic um, uh, nature, right? And that seems to be the claim of the book. I just worry that this is maybe a bit overly pessimistic, because um, a friendlier mode of reasoning together seems possible, at least I hope so, because this is precisely what current reform in philosophy in our discipline aims at, right? We try to promote diversity in the classroom and all, all levels, at all levels of career by um, reducing the adversarial character of uh, philosophy, public, uh, of our joint deliberation. So maybe, maybe this is over. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and the second um, observation about reasoning in groups. Um, so you make the observation that deliberation tends to drive group members apart rather than make them converge on a single solution. I think that, that, that may be uh, accurate. Um, I just ask myself how this threatens the possibility of epistemic democracy. So how precisely do I do that? Because um, I do not quite see why it would be necessary for the epistemic functioning of democracy that voters, voters form one big group in which people converge on um, one solution rather than um, maybe split up in three groups, every platform yeah. um, has its group and, and they converge each of their solution and finally a decision is made. So maybe you want to say more about that. Um, let's leave it at that. Um, so the second big issue in your paper is of course authoritative belief and trust, and I want to say that just to ask you one question about this. Um, you present Fabian Peters' mixed view that mm -hmm. seems to admit that at least in some scenarios, epistocracy mm -hmm. would see more truth tracking than deliberative procedures. And you're, you say you're dissatisfied with this mixed view because epistemic deference is, quote you, constitutive of our own par political participation. Mm -hmm. So I'm um, here also a little bit puzzled as to how this bears on the epistemic justification of democracy. Because, um, well, when, so here's a suggestion how it might bear on it. You may just say more on if you think this is the case. If everyone has to defer epistemically to others on all or virtually all political or relevant matters, so there's always an expert for, for something, um, that, that seems to radically call into question the very idea of epistemic democracy. So this would be really um, a stab in the heart. Um, because um, the, I, I take it that the idea of epistemic democracy is that everyone has to contribute some important information to the decision. Um, then I was also asking, because you connect this point to, um, again, to the uh, Iraq war, um, <coughs> decision, um, if people really have to epistemically defer to the government in whether this is necessary in any way, right? It seems natural to defer to scientific experts, but the, the, the case you presented there um, was one in which the public was supposed to defer judgment to uh, the communications um, um, guy of the British government, and this is maybe uh, uh, just, um, I, I wonder if this example can illuminate uh, what you have in mind with the point about um, authoritative belief and trust. Um, now, your conversation with Etienne on the fake news threat, I find this was a really a very interesting because you um, advanced an interesting argument. Um, you think that fake news is less worrisome than Etienne thinks yeah. um, because of an argument, so to speak, from commercial advertisement. We, we handle manipulation in the commercial advertisement pretty well, um, so why would manipulation by fake news undermine epistemic democracy? I think um, advertisement, um, this, this argument might be a little bit a numb sword because um, in the case of commercial advertisements there are always competitors who also use the same sort of um, manipulation and that it seems to cancel out the effects of one company advertising their products. Um, but as has already been pointed out yesterday in the discussion, um, this seems at least up to now not to be the case. So for example, the Democratic Party does not, um, is not supported, let's put it like that, to the same degree with, by, by uh, a fake news industry as um, the um, Republican camp was. So, so um, maybe this is an, a, a relevant uh, a difference that a, a little bit undercuts the, the power of this argument from advertising. Mm. Um, there is a second argument that you advance, which is the argument from actual Twitter usage. And here you refer to your, your own research. You say that people are not global. They, they 
use heuristics to evaluate um, the value, yeah. epistemic value of trigger messages. Um, in, in, in the case that I mentioned, which is a case of extreme situations. They in are extreme not valuable. Okay, maybe that's yeah. an important uh, restriction. So, because there there's clearly seem to be deceptive strategies that circumvent these heuristics, um, you, you have uh, the um, case of massive use of, of uh, tweet bots by I don't know whom, and in the recent text in, in the UK you've seen um, 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 even, even um, apparently humans who, who tweet these, these uh, fake tweets um, about which persons are missing that actually aren't. Um, against the, so it, it seems like there are deceptive strategies to circumvent these heuristics, and maybe you want to say something about that. Also, the, the quality heuristic, um, I, I remember from, a, from the talk of Neil Levy that he gave here on yeah. fake news that um, he pointed out that when, for example, portals like Breitbart News um, present untruths, <laughs> yeah. they usually come wrapped in truths, so there is a lot of information content on the portal, mm -hmm. just yeah. um, some, some of them are um, pretty um, blatantly um, false. But Maybe the most critical point about your argument from trivial usage is that it, you seem to be unimpressed, and I don't know why, by something else that Neil Levy points out, namely that even when people um, know that the source of an information is bad, and even if they yeah. um, are brought to discover that they were wrong on this, um, there remains an, an, an effect on their system one, and, and they, they somehow ret retain traces of this confrontation with fake yeah. news that lead them to make bad decisions mm -hmm. in the future. So he presents evidence on this then. So why, why are you not impressed by it? No, the, why it's, uh, I can it's present evidence from, from my book. Good, okay. Um, I don't believe in system one, system two. Okay. It's just like old stuff. Good, just one, one uh, mm -hmm. last point and then the comment is finished. Um, mm -hmm. the, as to the big data thread in Cambridge Analytica, um, here's maybe a moral argument for both by comparison that not only one's digital avatar or not knowing what it is, it's maybe not as mm, mm, morally and politically problematic as you make it appear. I mean, I have a predictive model of you two in my head, uh, feed it by all the stuff I, I, I know about you, I've seen uh, all the evidence I've had, and you don't own it, and that seems all right. And it seems like what um, these big data companies are doing is Precisely that, just on an, an industrial scale. So maybe you want to clarify the nature of your argument there. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Thank you. But first of all, I must say, as you may have uh, noticed by reading the paper so, so carefully, that I don't have an argument. So uh, Daniel started l yesterday with a, a joke uh, in philosophy. There is another joke in philosophy. When you don't have an argument, make a distinction. And uh, uh, if you don't, even if you don't have a, even a distinction, make examples. This is really so. I basically pour some reflections my in my. My joke is better. Huh? My joke is better. <laughs> you think so? We're gonna we're gonna have a, a poll and then decide. <laughs> uh, but it is true. I mean, usually you don't have an argument, make a distinction, you go through, and it's uh, the paper. And uh, I don't even even had interesting distinctions, so I made a lot of examples. So basically, I wanted to, in a sort of quite impressive, Im Im impressionistic way, uh, 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 throw some um, reflect. I mean, pour some reflection that give you a flavor of my of my own research, because it is true that it is not. I'm sure that you're not so familiar with it, because uh, I come really from another from another perspective. So thank you for the effort of finding some <laughs> sort of argument, but uh, I it really. Uh, it was really, I mean, uh, a, a super ration, rationalization of a series of uh, different uh, reflections that I, uh, that I have uh, presented to you. But of course, I mean, you're right. I, there is a point about trust that I, 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 I wish I could have been more precise uh, on it, but I think that, that uh, there is a point. I can't, uh, I, 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 yeah, I think that sort of our sort of differential mode of uh, believing is uh, widespread, and it's really, uh, it's, and it goes with our own, uh, um, with our own uh, epistemic life. We go, uh, I mean, if I, if I ask you questions like the question that I have uh, um, uh, 
the, that I have in my in my in my paper. Like, uh, you do you uh, think if there is a, a a way of stopping climate change uh, in uh, the I don't know next. Uh, uh, 100 years or etc. You're going to defer so, to some expertise that can be um, common sense, uh, uh, co um, uh, um, tacit knowledge in a society, experts that are, uh, who exist and who have a certain reputation or, or something. I mean, you we cannot. Uh, I don't think. I mean, I I I would like to 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 have the the, the opinion of uh, of people who seem to be more rational have a different model of, uh, of rationality. I think that deference is a part of our rationality and we defer and I would like to maybe in the, in, uh, the next uh, paper that, which is on the division of uh, cognitive labor or the division of uh, uh, political labor, I don't know. We, we need a sort of division of labor and we defer to each other and it's part of the organi cognitive organization of, of our society. A stronger point which don't, doesn't want to go too deep, I mean I don't want to be considered a sort of a, a, a deep relativist or a constructivist, but I think that this division of cognitive labor and the division of political <laughs> labor are intertwined. I mean, the cognitive order and the social order of our societies are deeply intertwined. I mean, when you, uh, when you say, well, I mean, uh, but we were trusting uh, politicians in the case of Iraqi war and not experts, but what they were, say, what they were doing, the politicians were presenting expert evidence all, uh, all, all the time. So we are in this kind of uh, uh, knowledge society, epistemically, I don't know, uh, uh, epistemically dense society in which uh, knowledge plays a political role that never played before, or maybe we can argue about this, but I mean, and, and so uh, political decisions are the more and more le legitimized and justified through uh, uh, expertise. And I don't think it is so easy to, uh, to, to separate the, the two, trust in, uh, uh, trust in political authority and trust uh, in expertise. Also, there is a paradox of trust. I mean, uh, why, I mean, trust is not such a, a, a cool um, uh, subject in, um, in uh, political theory because basically democracies uh, our system of distrust. What our power, I mean, is uh, our power as a citizen is just to vote against uh, uh, bad, uh, I don't know, uh, governors. So to distrust, uh, our power is, is the fact that we can distrust in uh, um, uh, politicians. And I mean, and it's, we are no more in paternalistic societies that uh, require trust in, uh, in the goodness of uh, Mr. Macron or uh, Mr. Trudeau or Mr. Renzi. So in a sense, you can say so trust and, and democracy is not a cool issue. There are, like, the literature is very, is very uh, limited. On the other hand, trust in, uh, uh, in knowledge and trust in, in the role of knowledge in democracy, this is a very uh, important uh, issue. And I think you cannot separate uh, uh, the two. Uh, what I was uh, separating in the paper, I mean, make distinction when you're not able to make arguments, were uh, cases of uh, well, I would say normal, uh, tr I mean, uh, inevitable trust in authority that can, can have uh, bad outcomes and through cases of propaganda or fake news uh, circulation. That was, my, uh, that was my distinction. As for propaganda and fake news, I also introduce other distinction. I don't think that all fake news are propaganda, and I th think that we can have a phenomenology or a sort of a uh, chart of what are the phenomena there that are uh, relevant. And uh, I think that uh, basically, yes, I'm not impressed by fake news, it is true. I, there is a lot of evidence uh, on uh, the two directions. I don't think, uh, ba basically I think that most uh, circulation of fake news is based on shareability, uh, uh, like conspiracy theories, why uh, this is, too good to be uh, too good to be true, but I mean it's so good that I share it because it's uh, so. This is the way in which these kind of stories have a, a, a very strong uh, uh, power in terms of cultural transmission. But what is very serious about fake news is not the fake news that you are sharing; is the contextual targeted advertisement that you are exposed to while sharing the fake news and to, so that for me is the cognitive control that uh, uh, 
well, uh, that scares me more, most in this, maybe because this, all this new, all, all this literature is a, is a little new and we are discovering things about ourselves and also about our naivete, the fact that we were naive in some behaviors on the, on the social uh, uh, media and uh, etc. This probably scares me a little bit more because I, I, I feel that I have less control, less cognitive control on this, but maybe you're right. Maybe this is a question of sensitivity. It's not a, uh, it's not a, a knockdown. Uh, I have evidence that we are all controlled by Cambridge Analytica. I don't have this kind of evidence, but I would tend to think that this is more important and this is more relevant than just fake news or other form of propaganda. Anyway, thanks a lot. I was too long. Let's go to... Yeah, it's yeah. Thank, thank you so much, uh, Gloria, for your for your uh, <laughs> tongue. I, I didn't know my, my draft would uh, would be so seriously considered. Uh -huh. But uh, but anyway, uh, so I won't comment on the on the the, the so-called disagreement that, uh, yeah. that that we're supposed to have because I think that uh, that Jens already did a good job at that. I'd much rather <laughs> ask you a question about something I actually don't know. So I'd like to know more about your concept of epistemic vigilance. Yeah. You just mention it. You're you're talking. Sure. You just mention it in your paper. I'd like to know how exactly that works. Yeah. What conditions need to be reunited in order to for us to consider that. Uh, that epistemic vigilance might might be at work, and I think it's very it's very important because if, if uh, uh, it does suggest that, uh, that that some of the findings like uh, Levy rely on uh, mm -hmm. would be would be less uh, threatening that that, uh, that that one may one may think. So I'd just like to know a little bit more about that. Yeah, it's it's a it's a field of research, epistemic vigilance, and there are a lot of papers on on this one, uh, which is the, the similar one. It is called epistemic vigilance, so it is <laughs> very it's a, two, a, a 2010 paper. And the main idea is this: people are not. Uh, I mean, you don't decide to enter like in the social contract, political social contract. You are there and decide to uh, what I do. Do I enter into uh, the society or do stay uh, stay out? With knowledge, this is impossible. We all are born and in a sort of broth of information and, and, and knowledge. We, we can't be skeptical. There are no, uh, but we are not uh, inevitably gullible. That means once you are sort of uh, immersed in this uh, deferential uh, sort of uh, uh, attitude, which is an old argument, you find it in Saint Augustin, you find it in Wittgenstein, uh, um, uh, uncertainty. I mean, we. Are, uh, we cannot even imagine the construction of our own uh, uh, beliefs and knowledge without def deference to, uh, uh, to other people. So this is a deep uh, uh, point uh, against other approaches, for example, that are more uh, uh, sort of human in, a, in, a, in epistemology. So this is a, a, an old debate uh, in, a, in, a, in epistemology. If we uh, are, if trust in testi testimony in, is inevitable or it is uh, 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 or uh, uh, it is reducible to other form of knowledge, etc., etc. So I don't want to go uh, through this, but the, the idea is this. Once you are uh, immersed, I mean, you are uh, inevitably uh, deferent to uh, some other people's knowledge, you develop strategies of uh, epistemic vigilance, because if you don't, you, I mean, evolutionary, you die. I don't, I don't buy all this evolutionary thing, but I mean, you develop strategies. So, and you can t test it even on, on, on small children. People uh, have preferences uh, and strategies and heuristics or whom to prefer as an informant, for example, and at the, uh, up to a certain age they prefer the benevolent informant, then they prefer the most, more competent informant, and so and so. So my point is, okay, we have to trust, we have to defer, but we are not stupid. I mean, so you have a sort of reason making and a, a, a rationality of this deference. So you, you, you filter, you, you and uh, in some context, but you have to be aware of the fact that you are in this uh, 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 trustful mode. I mean, if you're not aware, it is much more uh, difficult. So uh, I, uh, so epistemic vigilance uh, refer to all the strategies we have in different uh, 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 contexts to uh, mm, just uh, uh, pick up cues that, that make us uh, evaluate uh, information in a, uh, in a way that is more uh, uh, beneficial for us. I mean, that, is, that, that is the idea. So there are many, there are many strategies and uh, any context, for the context that I mentioned, for example, in the context of extreme events, uh, we studied the strategies that were uh, at place there. You were mentioning that the fact, for example, the quality of information strategy in other contexts doesn't work. Uh, I'm 
probably surely that is perfectly correct, but I mean, these are the kind of epistemic, uh, uh, but I'm gonna send you the paper. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I think there, there's, a, there's a danger, which I think we're all, we, we may all be succumbing to, or a lot of people may be succumbing to, and it's perfectly natural, uh, in the wake of Trump and Brexit, uh, to draw uh, the wrong conclusions uh, from it. So um, for me, I mean, and maybe this is just, you know, we all, we all, the wrong conclusions, or not to draw other conclusions. Maybe some of them are. So for me, these are failures. Institution, they're, they're institutional failures more than they are uh, um, uh, sort of failures of, of individual epistemic. So look at look at something like the referendum on, on Brexit. And you know, refer I mentioned the en passant yesterday that I thought referenda were a very bad idea. Why? Because they tend to uh, simplify decision spaces, right? Uh, you know, uh, in, in Scotland, it turns out that sorry. Misleading. Well, it, it just simplifies. It doesn't give people a, a way to express what they actually want. So in this country, we've had two referenda. You know, most Quebecers would rather have a kind of recognition of Quebec's sort of distinct status within the Constitution. That's not on offer. So we get, yes, do you want to stay in Canada as it is? No, do you want to leave uh, Canada? Scotland, right? Uh, Cameron uh, decided that he didn't want to let the, what was it called? Um, uh, De Debo Max. Uh, you know, option onto the, whereas most people sort of want a people match. So referenda have all kinds of well, uh, well uh, sort of documented uh, sort of flaws in terms of the way they yeah. represent the decision yeah. space uh, to, to people. So they, they kind of, it's not that people are stupid and, you know, whatever, they're being, you know, they're not being yeah. sufficiently epistemically vigilant. It's that the structure of the thing forces them into a situation where they don't express uh, their, their views. So one person's nodding, one person, that's great, I love that. Uh, yeah, but, and, yeah. You know, um, and so Trump is a little bit more difficult, but you know why is it the case that like a week after Trump was elected, people started saying that they were dissatisfied with the result? I mean, you know, uh, the, the fact is that the, the electoral system, partly because it, it you know it doesn't allow people to express their uh, their, their preferences in a more subtle manner, not just who they prefer but who they disprefer. Mm -hmm. So what kind of uh, you know the kind of thing that people who are in favor of um, of uh, lists of, of um, uh, sorry. No, of, of rank ballots, yeah, exactly, uh, uh, suggest. You know, they end up in a, in, in, you know, so I think that there are, um, yeah, there are I flaws see. in the ways yeah. in which, okay. in which the, 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 the institution is built, sure. which leads predictably to an epistemically some optimal result. Yeah, uh, sure. I mean, uh, this is your, this is your, this is your point of view. This is part of your, I mean, I think this, this is your competence also to, to, to point to flaws in the institutions. Right. I just want to add, uh, a sort of elephant in the room, which is these new technologies can be part uh, can, can be part of your reflection. I mean, if you you cannot. Uh, uh, I mean, th first of all, your explanation of Trump and Brexit are post hoc explanation. Are these flaws of uh, the institution? There are uh, situations in which there are situations in which referenda. Uh, uh, worked very well. I mean, uh, and they, they, uh, and there are situations in which the, the so. I'm a pre hoc opponent of referenda. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, I mean, I remember when I was a, a child in Italy, I mean, so many referenda for for for, for civil rights and etc., which really changed the life of my my mother and my, and uh, so I I'm not uh, I'm 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 not so critical. I mean, so you, I, I mean, I don't know, but I mean, the, in this particular case, I just wanted to add. When you have your uh, very uh, um, sort of institutional design and formal uh, views of uh, of uh, uh, why thing, uh, I mean it, it, it is just a matter of of uh, institutional design. I just want to add a sort of let let's say a, um, another another um, um, element that is uh, uh, the way in which today information is crunched and uh, redistributed in society can influence also uh, results in a way that should be at a certain point taken into account uh, I, I mean by also uh, political philosophers and uh, I think about for example the work of uh, someone who I, I admire a lot, uh, admire a lot uh, Larry Lessig for example he was one of the first who started to say well there are some constraints uh, uh, on internet, etc., that uh, uh, have to be considered in order to have a certain development of our democracies and society, etc. Basically, he pointed out so many years ago that uh, we owe to Al Gore the fact that internet internet exists, the fact that the pro the, the, co the um, all the um, uh, um, 
protocols though, like IP, TCP, HTTP, etc., uh, have been maintained uh, um, open. Uh, 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 they, they are not proprietary, they, they are commons. And this was, uh, I mean, internet, as you know, Fra French always have invented uh, the same thing before, mm -hmm. for every, uh, there is always a French that have invent, has invented, I don't know, the press and etc. They had invented the internet, it is true, in the 80s. It was called Minitel, but the, 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 the protocols were proprietary. They, they were property of uh, telecom, so it just uh, remained in France. And it is thanks to the law that the internet became such a big phenomenon. So, so I think that this is interesting also for institutional design, to take into account some uh, new ways of circulating information uh, that uh, can really uh, uh, harm or support our institution. So we went a bit overboard. We still have 10 minutes and three questions. Do you want to just have all three as questions? You want, and as then you wish. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Justin, uh, Ellen, and myself. All right. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the talk. And I uh, fully agree with you uh, that we also need that Concerning the, the, the study on uh, on Twitter and, uh, and and fake news, uh, so if I understand, because normally if we want to, maybe the first the intuition that comes to mind when uh, we try to explain why do fake news uh, work, right? Why are, why are they uh, effective? Uh, my hunch was that it has something to do with uh, uh, some of our cognitive biases and especially confirm confirmation bias, right? So yeah. uh, people uh, they see the it's fake news. Fits with their uh, system of belief, or it confirms, mm -hmm. validates, you know, what they uh, strongly held the position, and they think, well, it, it has to be true, and so they sincerely believe in uh, the fake uh, news. But you're saying that, uh, uh, on the basis of that study, that many people were actually aware that it was probably fake, that it was probably false, actually false, but it was like too good, right, not to share. <laughs> yeah. So in in these cases, it's more strategic reasoning, saying, well. Yeah. Because it was probably be extreme, ca ca yeah. If, uh, we mm. circulate that. So, uh, is your overall position is that both the confirmation bias, you know, explain why fake news do are effective in some area you know, for some people, but that we're also do we also had to uh, add uh, that, that strategic component to it, and, and this leads us to like uh, insincerity. Like people know that it's fake, but they will circulate it. So it's a form mm. of manipulation. So is it both, or is it? Mostly strategic, in, uh, according to your study. I, I always consider that uh, <coughs> uh, there are two kinds of constraints cognitive constraints and institutional or uh, technological or cultural constraints in the transmission of information. So, the two, I, you have to consider both. So, clearly, confirmation bias is the strongest uh, cognitive constraints we have in all our parsing of uh, information, but then we have uh, communicative constraints. Uh, and uh, uh, communicative strategies uh, that can go much uh, beyond uh, uh, the transmission of, of uh, factual information or truth, etc. So uh, this is a. Mm, so we want to uh, uh, we want to say interesting thing. We want to persuade. Persuade. We want to make a, uh, an information. Uh, circulate because it is at the second order to, to make fun of it, uh, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, uh, and so uh, the two constraints are important. The case that I'm mentioning is very specific. It is a, a case of using of Twitter. Twitter is very, uh, is used in a situation of like a, um, catastrophe, natural catastrophes, uh, uh, revolutions, uh, earthquakes, in uh, what, what uh, are called extreme situations. And in this case, uh, the information, the, the fake news that circulate are very rapidly uh, corrected, and you can, and you can uh, measure it. Uh, of course, in other, in other situation, uh, uh, the, the circulation is motivated by much less uh, factual uh, needs. I mean, I want to know really what is happening uh, there. So uh, the correction is uh, the, the correction is different. What I was uh, I also wanted to point at, and I already s said in, re in reply replying to to Etienne, that what what is more important is what we are exposed to when we are in a fake news environment. So we are sharing fake news. Uh, what we are exposed to is targeted. Uh, 
um, information, a targeted uh, advertisement, and this uh, is, uh, uh, well, and this can be really manipulated in a, in a bad way. I mean, so. Yeah, so, so on the, um, I just wanted to one, one is on the, the topic of fake news, just wanted yeah. to question a bit the, on your side actually the, the efficacy of, 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 of fake news and you know, the yeah. maybe it's a little overhyped and maybe it's yeah. just a temporary glitch because it was a study that I could look into the, by Matt Genskow and um, uh, Alcott that, that yeah. said that basically in, a, in the American presidential elections fake news make no difference whatsoever. That most people are able to I tell the it. difference between true and fake and uh, so yes, there's a minority that, that believes it, but mm. it's a very, very tiny minority in the end. So, so maybe it's kind of a right Like thing. conspiracy theories. Yeah. So, and no. the other thing, so I, the, I really love the, the idea of the statistical avatar. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I, it's an interesting uh, intermediary between the public self and the private self. Yeah. And, and I, I wanted to hear more about what you have to say in response to the question of, you know, do we own that statistical avatar? What rights do we have with respect mm. to it? Yeah. Uh, so th that's really uh, a new research project and I'm working on uh, it with a student of mine who is now at UCLA. So she has more uh, data on it and we already published an article on this with on the case of um, on Google, not uh, on... Uh, and uh, so what we really own about our statistical uh, avatars uh, on, uh, on Google. Google has introduced personalization functions in 2009. You can uh, go through part of the story in, in my in my uh, paper, and we don't know so much uh, uh, what we uh, what uh, we own, and basically all this uh, 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 literature on uh, uh, statistical avatars uh, is uh, is in a legal hole. I mean, there is no uh, uh, so you consent, you give out. Uh, also, all these uh, this statistical avatars are are basically are built. Uh, on information we have consented to uh, to give away, so it's very difficult to uh, it's very difficult to control. So it's a new area, uh, and it's a new area of study, and also of legal studies. What we can do, what we can, what we can uh, uh, control. Also, we have data that people are terribly inconsistent about uh, privacy. So, for example, if you ask people, would you give away all your information? Uh, to Ellen Landermore uh, now, you say no, no, or to the government, or to the, uh, or to a company, no, of course not. I mean, I care about my privacy. Then you have to find a restaurant in Montreal, and you uh, and you uh, download an app, and uh, the only way to get the the the, the street uh, of the the name of the restaurant and the street is to give away all the your mother and father information <laughs> or your kids and your blood pressure etc you say yes immediately and we have data on this so this is like crazy so what uh, just maybe we can, we can i don't know introduce a new concept like uh, epistemic incontinence I mean, <laughs> how can we retain <laughs> restrain ourselves and people say that privacy is the most important thing of their lives and maybe we have given away and i have a facebook account and a tn too so i mean we are completely responsible of our destiny <laughs> I mean, so, and so it's a, a, a it's, it's, we, we don't, uh, we, we give, we, we have consent, uh, uh, we, we, you can extract um, uh, on Google, you can extract uh, 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 an avatar of Ellen Alandermore with your uh, past uh, uh, movements, etc. and uh, uh, also with your preference, because of course, uh, uh, it's very interesting, you can do it, I can give you the yeah. website, you can do it, and you can, and, uh, and this, and you can ask them to, to have it, just to stop it, to, to, uh, to, to erase it, and to, uh, and to keep it for you. This is the only thing you can, you, you can do. Uh, for the rest, what is sold, to other companies, how to is it is a, it is very vague. Basically, Cambridge Analytica and Facebook didn't break any law. Didn't break any law. I mean, uh, the, the, this thing about Mechanical Turk can be a case interesting. I don't know what uh, I mean. It's really new uh, stuff. 
But basically, um, Cambridge Analytica used apps, Facebook apps that are available even to us. I mean, so it's, uh, they didn't break any law. So it's a big, it's a big uh, <coughs> hole, and I hope that your students will <laughs> start to work on it. And you had a Great. I, I will keep mine for lunch. Uh, sure, sorry. Already, uh, we already were over so, time, yeah. Yes. Yeah, uh, thank you so much. Thank you. Yes.